psalmist said that I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul has made her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. And here's the invitation. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I greet you in the name of the Lord and on behalf of my pastor, Dr. Joshua Beckley. Was anybody blessed last week when Pastor Beckley taught us about who we are? Amen, amen. He said that you know, in, anybody who names the name of Jesus Christ is a new creation in Jesus Christ. And then he told us that God has given us something other than eternal life. He's also given us the ministry of reconciliation. Those of us who know and have accepted Jesus Christ and received the forgiveness of sins and all the blessings that go along with that. Listen, you have that happened because God reconciled you to himself amen and then God has given us the ministry of reconciliation so guess what God expects each one of us to do to reconcile others to Jesus Christ Amen. Amen. So where are we going today? Hallelujah. Uh, before, before I tell you where we're going, I think we better pray. I think we better pray. Precious Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you, thank you, thank you for making us new creations in you. And Father, we thank you that you would invest in us and give us the ministry of reconciliation. So, Father, we pray even as we uh, entertain this message today, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts, that you will perform a surgery, that you will perform a work, that you would make us think and act more like your son, Jesus. We thank you for it today. Lord, and we ask it all now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So if you would, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we are going to consider verses 1 through 10. Amen. Is my brother Albert here today? Amen. We are going to look at verses 1 through 10. And as a matter of fact, let's let's read that. Let's read that before we get going. I highly recommend the New King James Version. And as we go through the sermon, you'll understand why. So I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Starting at verse one, it says, we then uh, as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. In much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labor, in sleepiness, in fasting, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand on the, and the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing 
all things. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak to you today from the theme, from the subject, the marks of ministry. The marks of ministry. Now, there's a there's an awful lot to unpack in this passage today. And we will do our very best to journey through this God given material in a timely manner. And I just want to make a promise to you today that we will be done before the sun goes down. Amen. Amen. Look, we might we might get a little bit before then, but but this is what I want you to do. I want you to keep your Bibles open. Amen. If you don't have a problem with it, I do it all the time. I encourage you to highlight, circle, underline, whatever you need to do to help us to get into this passage. We want to get into the word of God and we want the word of God to get into us. Amen. Amen. So I want you to to mark it up again using the New King James Version. I say that because other versions say it a little bit differently. But the way the Lord instructed me to give this to you, uh, the New King James says it cleanly and plainly. Amen. And as far as Gump says, that's all I got to say about that. So before we get started, uh, I want to share just a couple of, couple of things with you that will help us uh, as we move through this passage. First of all, there are some structural observations that we want to make. A pastor preached last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and he made the statement, we came to the conclusion based on the truth of the word of God, that as a believer, you are a new creation in Christ. That's foundational for what we're talking about today. And then in verses 18 through 21 of chapter 5, uh, pastor helped us to see that we have the ministry of reconciliation. That passage that he preached last week is the reason for this entire sermon series called Your Life is Ministry. And so, again, this is all foundational to where we're going today. So now in chapter 6, verse 1, that is a direct continuation from chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. Okay, you need to know that. You need to know that. And then that third verse in chapter 6, that is a direct continuation from chapter 6, verse 1. Okay, we're trying to we're trying to trying to tie it together so so it'll it'll be a little more clear. Now, what about 6-2? I just skipped over 6-2, right? Well, let me explain why. 6-2 was a parenthetical thought that Paul had while he was writing this. Now, what does that mean? That means that, as, as, we, as we say, uh, he was hit with the Holy Ghost. He was full. Something, something tied together for him. And he uttered this statement in, in verse 2. But it does not necessarily go with the flow of what he's saying in chapter 5, 17 through 6, 3. Parenthetical statements, and we'll talk about that more when we get there. And then in a, a, a grammatical observation for you, um, chapter 6, verse 4 through 10, that long, long, long section that we just read, verses 4 through 10, watch this is a single sentence. All of that is a single thought that just flowed from the mind of the Apostle Paul for our benefit. So we'll explain that a little bit when we get there. Now, some biblical background, biblical observations. Uh, this book of 2 Corinthians, I want you to keep in mind that this was the most personal writing by the Apostle Paul. And so in this book, more than any other writing that he wrote, you should see his emotions coming out. Why? Because Paul was the founder of the church in Corinth. 
you know, it was his mission to go where the gospel had never been and preach the gospel. And he established churches in a whole lot of places. He got to Corinth. And I tell you, if you've ever if you do a background on the store on, on the city of Corinth, Lord, 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 pray while you are studying that you liable to fall into temptation just for finding out what was going on in Corinth. How's that? And so he goes to this heathenistic city. He preaches the truth of the gospel and folks get saved. So he founded the church and the church that he founded, many of the members there were folks that he personally led to salvation in Jesus Christ. So now just imagine he, he look, he, he invested 18 months in teaching. There's only one church that he stayed longer. That was at the church in Ephesus. Every place else, he was there for a little while. He would establish it. He'll turn it over to the leaders. He's going to the next place to continue to do what, what the Lord called him to do. He spent 18 months in Corinth. And then sometime later, he hears that these that he had led to Christ, these that he had taught, these that he had personal relationship with were now turning to false teaching taught by false teachers who accused Paul himself of being a false teacher. So as we go through this section, he is reminding believers of what he taught and what the Lord did in their lives. Amen. Some of us in here today might need to be reminded of the teachings of the Lord and what the Lord has done in our lives. He reemphasized that we are new creations in Jesus Christ. And that we were reconciled to God. Now, what, let, 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 let's, let's take a quick, quick second on that. Uh, to be reconciled to God, we need to understand before a person is reconciled to God, reconciled, the reason why you need to be reconciled is because, as we would say today, there might be some irreconcilable differences between two. They cannot come together, so they would be considered enemies, or King James using the word enmity, which means the two cannot come together. We got a problem. Our problem is sin. And because of our sin problem, we cannot get with God because God is holy and God does not allow sin in his presence. God is just and God is required and obligated to, to judge sin. And God is a God of wrath. We don't hear that too often, but God's going to do what he said because he said it. And so man had a problem. And that problem was sin, sin that separated us from a holy God. There's nothing that man can do to, 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 to fix this sin problem. So God comes up. He, he had, as, as, as Bishop Omer would say, he had a divine design in his mind. To save mankind. Amen. That rhymed. I didn't do that on purpose. Thank, thank you, Lord. So, so what God chose to do is he would send his son, Jesus, to take the place of us who deserve to die because of our sin. He sent Jesus to die in our place. That's what it means that we were reconciled because Jesus died. Now we can get with God because God has done some things for us. He's reconciled us. So there's no more separation. Are we together? And then Paul goes on and he emphasize, reemphasizes to believers that God has given us the ministry 
of reconciliation. Okay, let me keep moving. Let me, let me keep moving. Paul says that your life is ministry. Your life is ministry. So as we look at this passage, first 10 verses of chapter 6, uh, there are some marks of ministry that result from three types of ministry commitments. Some marks of ministry that result from three ministry commitments. The first thing we see in verse 1 and verse 3 is a no way commitment. Somebody say no way. Amen. What is that talking about? That's going back to the sin that we talked about earlier as a believer, as a new creation in Christ, as one that has the ministry of reconciliation, as an ambassador of Christ. There are some things that come up in our life. We have some opportunities and our biblical spiritual response is no way. Amen. There's a no way commitment. There is a display commitment. Amen. Amen. The manifestation of what's in your heart is what's displayed in certain situations. The representation of your relationship with the Lord is what's displayed in certain situations. So there's a no way commitment. There is a display commitment and there is a two day commitment. Amen. That's going we're going we going to end up on we're going to skip verse 2 and then we're going to end on verse 2. All right. So are we ready? Say say I am if you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, say I am a new creation in Christ. Say I am an ambassador for God. Say my life is ministry. Amen. Amen. So marks of ministry result from number 1 a no way commitment. So right there in verse 17, chapter five, verse 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Who are we in Christ? We are new creations. Now, as a good student of the Bible, I teach all the time that, that you know, when we study the Bible, we want answers. But, you know, one of the best ways to come up with answers in the Bible is to ask questions. So there's a question that comes up right here in this text. Uh, if, if old things have passed away, a good Bible study question is what passed away? Amen. Amen. So here's the first thing. Uh, and I'm so glad you asked that question. Here's the first thing that passed away. The penalty of sin has passed away. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the first part of the verse says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, because of your sin, the thing that you have earned, the payment that is due to you because of your sin is death. Amen. But this is how beautiful the Lord is. He says in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he says, but if we would confess our sins, he is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Amen. So here is another quick biblical question. Uh, this is the second question. We're going to go back to the first question. But, but if God has cleansed us of all unrighteousness, how much unrighteousness is left in us? Look, I'm hearing all kind of answers. So let me ask you one more time. If God has cleansed us of all unrighteousness, how much unrighteousness is left in us? None. So how do we deal? How do we, you know, how do we get back to that sin area? We make a choice. We open the door. Amen. But God in his forgiveness, he's cleansed us. 
And we can we can say praise God for that. And then last one, Romans chapter eight, verse one, it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's all hallelujah material right there. The penalty of sin has passed away. Amen. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you do not have to worry about losing your soul in eternity. Amen. Okay, let's keep going. Now, another thing that that is lost is the power of sin over you. Amen. The power of sin over you. So you need to understand as a believer in Jesus Christ that, that God not only saved you, but he also infused you. He, he put something in you. He, he put something in you to help you. Now, what he put in us is called his Holy Spirit. In other words, the spirit of God himself dwells within us. So when we have to make choices, then the spirit of God is leading us, guiding us and directing us. And as my, min- my brother H- Minister Harvey says all the time, a, a good Christian life is as simple as obeying what the Lord says. Amen. Amen. So the power of sin does not have reign over us again. Now, again, we can make some choices and we can open that door and and we I use the word abdicate power back to Satan that he does not have. We can do that. But we can also choose to obey the leading, guiding and direction of the Holy Spirit. Is that good? Amen. So now what else passed away? Uh, did anybody ever felt alone? You just kind of feel like, you know, especially before you accept Christ, it's like life is just, I just feel so alone. Well, one of the things that the Lord promised to each of his children in Hebrews chapter 13, verse five, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I heard one teacher, one Bible teacher say that that even works when it's said backwards. Look at this. You forsake nor you leave. Never will I. That's the message that the Lord gives to each one of us. So we don't have to feel alone. Now, you know, one of the things I struggled with before I came to Christ, uh, there was kind of like a hopelessness of life. There was a lot of good things that I did in life, that kind of thing, um, you know, just but, but it was still like a hopelessness. It's like I got some issues. Anybody in here got issues besides me? Amen. But God said in the book of Jeremiah that God has a plan for each one of us. Amen. He, he, he said his plans to prosper you. And not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future. Amen. So what passed away? The penalty of sin, the power of sin, feeling alone, the hopelessness of life. The last thing we'll talk about is the fear of death. Anybody? Let me say it this way. Anybody know anybody that had a fear of death? Amen. Well, look, as a believer in Jesus Christ. We don't even have to fear death. Amen. Look, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. He didn't just say, I go to prepare a place. He he was specific. He said he goes to prepare a place for you. Paul made the statement to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That sounds pretty good to me. And then Psalm 23, that last verse says that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why do we have to fear death? We don't. We know what's going to happen. We're going to spend eternity with the Lord. Amen. Amen. So what passed away? That's just a that's just a few things that passed away. Amen. But as we move into this, the next part of this passage, uh, there's there we'll see another thing that passed away Um, again. If you if you were living life without purpose. Then God gave you 
a purpose. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21, says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, notice that word, a form of the word reconcile was used five times in that passage. Do you think the Lord's trying to get something across to us? He's talking about purpose. His purpose is to save man. Our purpose is to save man. We, we have any wise believers in here? Look, I'm sitting here looking at Minister Ron, and I know one of his favorite passages is Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. He who wins souls is wise. The Lord has given us a ministry of reconciliation. So no more life without purpose. God has given us purpose. God, oh, God has entrusted us. Let, 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 let's go all the way personal. God has, say, say this, say, God has entrusted me with the divine design in his mind. Think about that. God's plan to save the world, he's entrusting it to you. Oh, my goodness. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, well, look, that was a super long introduction. We are finally back at our past chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Look at what it says. It says, we then as workers together, as workers together with him, we are workers together with him. We are partners with God. We are co-laborers with God. Look, and, and I want that one to sink in. Can God do this all by himself? He could. Did he choose to do it all by himself? No. He chose to use you and me. Amen. Amen. So swallow that one. Look, and, and just think about it. That, that out of all the people in the world that God could have chose to be a partner, he chose you. Look, God sees value in you. God sees worth in you. Anybody in here? Trust the Lord. Can I flip it? Do you know that when it comes to the ministry of reconciliation, that God trusts you? Think about those that you know that don't know Jesus Christ. Those that are headed to getting the payment for the sin that they, you know, they, they earn that payment and that that payment is coming. The reason why they know you is because the Lord has entrusted the ministry of reconciliation to you. I was teaching teaching a Bible study with some UCR students on Thursday, and a statement came out, and I think it applies right here. There is one thing worse than dying and going to hell. That's to turn around and see those that you know that are also in hell because they followed you. 
And the other side of that, there might be something better than us getting to heaven. And that's to turn around and see all the people who are in heaven because they followed you. God has given you and trusted you with the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. Amen. So God's plan is to reconcile. God's man or God's woman are ambassadors. God's pressing is that we would plead, that we would implore, that we would beg. And God's blessing is that he has declared us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good? I like that. I like that. So, so in this passage, the same passage, there are three, um, three negative affirmations, if there is such a thing. Um, the no way, he says right here in this passage, um, in verse three, he says, we give no offense in anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Back to verse one. I'll skip verse one. Um, he says not to receive the grace of God in vain. So the no way, the first no way is that we would not receive the grace of God in vain. So as believers, you know how sometimes we can slip into complacency. Sometimes we can take the Lord for granted. Sometimes we can overlook the blessings that the Lord has given to us, all of that results in us taking the Lord for vain. Look, you, 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 ever, you ever said the Lord's name in vain? I pray we don't do that because uh, the Lord, his name is holy and his name is not to be a, a, a response to something that happened in life other than we're trying to get folks to know who he is. So all of these, he did. So no way will we receive the grace of God in vain. And then in verse three, uh, and we give no offense in anything. OK, so no way will we offend in anything. Now, what, what is that? What is that talking about? Uh, we, we, we refuse to put a stumbling block in somebody else's way. Amen. As as believers, as saved, we have liberty. But anytime that liberty becomes a stumbling block for somebody else. So our response should be no way that we would do anything that would offend anybody else. And then the last part of verse three, it says that our ministry not be blamed. So no way will I do anything that will cause the ministry to be blamed. Amen. Those are commitments that we can make and should make. And, and with this one, I just I just marveled uh, as I was studying this passage and the fact that our pastor had assigned this passage to me, uh, knowing that I was one that took the Lord for granted, that I was one that defamed the name of the Lord, that the Lord would be gracious enough to reconcile me and give me still the ministry of reconciliation. You know, that, 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 that speaks to, that just speaks to the Lord's, the power of the Lord's forgiveness. You know, there, the, look, we can do some things in life. And once we do those things in life, that does not mean that everything's going to go okay because the Lord forgave us. You know, look, there, there's some recompenses that we're, we'll suffer for some of the things that we did. But relationally, our relationship with the Lord, when he forgives, he forgives. And I like what one preacher said. He said that when God forgives our sins, he takes our sins and he separates it as far as the east is from the west. Now, if he said north to south, you know, north and south have an ending point. There's a North Pole and the south. If you go east, you just keep going east. If you go west, you just keep going west. So he separated our sin. One, 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 one person said that he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. And then he puts up a sign 
that says no fishing. Amen. So if you, like me, have done some things in your life that you wish you could go back and do over, but you can't. You need to know if the Lord has forgiven you, you are forgiven. Amen. Amen. And then I like what Jesus told the, told the woman that had been called in adultery. He said, go and sin no more. Amen. When he gives us that chance to he reconciles us, we want to do it right from that. Look, today and tomorrow, I'm going to walk in this ministry of reconciliation as an ambassador of Christ because I am a new creation. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. 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 OK, so so that's that's the no way commitment. Let's talk about the display commitment and I'm going to pick up the pace just a little bit. So you look, if I start talking a little faster, y'all have to listen a little faster. How's that? Amen. So in verse four, verse four, he says, but in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. Here comes another question. How do ministers of God legitimately commend themselves? Think about that. He says that we commend ourselves as ministers of God. Now, I looked at that word. Now, if you've been going through this series on 2 Corinthians, you would have noticed that that word commend has come up several times. I think the first time we saw that word was in chapter 3, and that was talking about folks that walked around with letters of commendation, and those letters from somebody else was supposed to give them some importance, some value that they wouldn't have otherwise. That was an illegitimate commending. And then we saw in verse 4 where Paul used as an example believers manifesting the truth, thus commending themselves in the sight of God. And so there is a negative commending and there is a positive commending. And then we see it also in in chapter 5, verse 12. We see it in 10, 12 when we get there. When we get to chapter 12, verse 11, we'll see that commending again right here. Paul is saying that our lives, our ministry ought to commend us. And so I look, look, so I'm, I'm, I'm like, OK, 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 OK. Now, I'm I'm not real clear on this command. So let me let me take a deeper dive. And I started pulling out some dictionaries and some other Bible resources. And the simple one, Strong's Concordance says that command means to demonstrate, to bring out or to prove to be. Amen. To demonstrate, to bring out or to prove to be. And then I I pulled out the Theological Dictionary of New Testament Terms. Amen. Ten volume set. Got all kind of dust on it. But I got some good use out of it right here. It, It So it emphasized that command means to prove or to show. In other words, our acts are a determination in the judgment of God before men and before ourselves that we are living the will of God. That we should commend ourselves. That's a powerful word. So then Paul actually in this passage gives three ways that he displays this commending of himself. We together? Amen. Amen. And and the reason why we're using New King James, because the New King James has a grammatical outline that helps us to see this. And so we'll learn from Paul's example, uh, this, his display of commitment, and hopefully we'll learn some things that we can use in our lives ourselves. Amen. So when in this passage, verses four and five, uh, there are outward circumstances in which Paul displays his commitment. And how do we see that? We see that in the the word in, I in. He says, in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleepiness, in fastings. All of these 
are outside circumstances. All of these are things that's outside of Paul's control. But he finds himself in these situations. And I would dare say that none of us would want to be a part of any of those types of situations. But it's outside of our control. And if we find ourselves in an outside circumstance, we still need to display commitment to the Lord. So let me let me let me let me let me let me say this. Let me say this using the, the, the King James Bible language. The Lord gave me this morning. Look, I wanted not to face undesired outward circumstances. Yet it mattereth not the outward situations. Faith it, face it, I such. My inner qualities displayed my commitment. My commitment displayeth the manifestation of what's in my heart, and my commitment is a representation of my relationship to the Lord. Amen. That's where, that's where we're trying to go. That's why we're trying. So, so when you face, let me, maybe I might be by myself again. Is anybody faced any outward situations, circumstances that you wish you were not in? You can't seem to get out of it. And, and you praying, you know, just like Paul prayed, deliver me from this thorn in the flesh. And what did God say? My grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. There's something that the Lord does even when we're in those situations. Look, our, our, pastor, our pastor used to say it like this. He says to grow where you're planted. Whatever the situation is, God has a purpose and plan for you being right there. Amen. So let's keep going, keep going. So, so then in verses uh, 6 through 8, this is talking about inward qualities. How, how does Paul display commitment through inward qualities? And we see that by the word by. He says, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the power of truth or the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, and by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. Those were inward qualities that helped Paul to display a commitment to the Lord, even when he's facing those outward circumstances. And I encourage you, each one of these that Paul lists, it will be good to go and do some study on each one. And I promise you, the Lord will give you some good, good for your spiritual life. Amen. And so the last last part we see in verses eight through 10, we see some contrasting statements the, the, the Paul Paul displays commitment based on these contrasting statements. He says it usually starts with the word as and it ends with a statement yet and then something that follows that. What does he say? He says as deceivers. That's what folks accused him of. He says, and yet true. He says, as unknown, folks treated Paul like he was somebody that was unknown, yet well known. He spent 18 months with them. He knew them personally. Look, as dying, they tried to kill Paul several times. And behold, we live. Amen. As chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing as poor. Look, yet making many rich. Amen. And having nothing, yet possessing all things. So these qualities that, 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 that Paul had on the inside helped him as he went through those outward circumstances that folks should be able to look at him and say that he has commended himself. He has displayed commitment to the Lord. Are we good? Amen. Doesn't matter 
what your outward circumstances are. What does matter is your inner qualities, the manifestation of what's in your heart, the representation of your relationship with God. Amen. So we've talked about a no way commitment. Then we talked about a display commitment. And then lastly, we want to look at a today commitment. And we're almost done. We're almost done. Look, we could, we, you know, well, I could stretch it because we got a lot of daylight left. Amen. Amen. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, for he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, I told you earlier, that was a parenthetical statement. So Paul was writing, he's thinking, he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord hit him with a thought. You ever been arrested by the Lord? A thought just consumes you, and you just can't quite get away with it uh, from it, and it, it, just, it just attracts your attention, and you just have to spend some time with that, spend some time with the Lord, and you are just overwhelmed at the power, the grace, the love, the mercy, and the glory of God. That's verse 2. So, so that first part of the phrase, it says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. So Paul, being an Old Testament scholar, knew that that referred back to the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 7. Uh, that was a situation where the children of Israel had been so disobedient to the Lord for so long. They had taken the Lord's name in vain for so long. God had warned them time and time and time and time again and told them that the wrath of God was coming unless you straighten up do you think they straightened up no so then this passage that Isaiah shared in in Isaiah 49 verse 7 Isaiah was prophesying to a time that would come after the exile even though Israel had not yet been exiled Okay, you, you with me on that? Isaiah, about 700 B.C., somewhere in that range, he's looking forward to another time to come. And so he actually paints a picture of the suffering that Jesus would go through. So look at what verse 7 says. It says, thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him who man despises, to him whom the nations abhor, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and rise. That's talking about what's going to happen after Jesus was crucified. Princes shall also worship. Behold the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. He has chosen you. It's almost as if the God the Father was encouraging God the Son that even though you're going to go through all that you go through at the hands of man, one day everything is going to be all right. Look, every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So Paul is studying this, and then it hit him that that's talking about a time that is coming in Isaiah's future. But guess what? For the apostle Paul, that was not future for him. That was now. So the second part of verse 2, it says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold. Now is the day of salvation. And so Paul realized that this is it. Folks are being saved, even as Isaiah prophesied. Folks are being saved because Jesus came. Jesus did ministry. Jesus suffered. Jesus bled. 
Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and he seated on the right hand of the majesty on high. And he sent his spirit to dwell within those that believe. Paul is saying now is that time. And guess what? We can say with the apostle Paul, because now is still that time. It's not too late. So if you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Look, Paul said there was there was an urgency and an emphasis with this appeal. Paul was highlighting that this is a privilege of the present. And he's trying to help us to see that there are some pitfalls from procrastination. And so if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, now is the time. Paul implies in this whole passage that it is unthinkable that the grace of God would be received in vain. Amen. So we want to give you an opportunity if you've never accepted the forgiveness, the salvation that Jesus offers to you. We want to give you that opportunity right now. So I want to ask you, if you would, everybody in the room, I want you to to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. And I want you to listen as the Lord speaks to your heart. You've heard the preaching, you've heard the singing, you've heard the worship. And you've heard the word. So if you are here today and you don't know for sure that if you were to die today that you would spend eternity in heaven with the Lord, you have an opportunity to make that choice right now. Accepting Jesus is is as simple as ABCs. A, I accept that I am a sinner. B, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And C, I commit my life to Jesus from this day forward. So if you'd like to give your life to Christ, I want you to repeat these words with me. You're not talking to me. You're talking to, to the Lord. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner and that I am in need of a Savior. So I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. I want to become a new creation in Christ. I want to be your child. So I ask you now to forgive me, to accept me, and to make me the kind of person you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you be bold enough just to raise your hand right where you are? If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, just raise your hand right where you are. We are just so grateful that God gives us opportunity. And and if you are new in the body of Christ, you prayed that prayer. Or if you want to become a part of Ecclesia Christian Fellowship, uh, you want to hang out with these people who need the Lord just like you do. Amen. We all need the Lord. Then go to our website uh, and in the button there, there's a button praying hands. And if you can give us some information that will allow us to contact you and then you can get plugged in and we can grow together and we can learn together, encourage each other and love each other. Amen. 
Amen. Amen.